Matt Frazier, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me, Dragon. Fun to be here. Heck yeah, brother. So let's let's ki- let let's dive in to a strange place that I know nothing about, but you seem to be very passionate about. Tell us about peasant cooking. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, almost. I'd say eighty percent of the dinners that I eat, I would classify as that. In Italy, it's called it's called cucina povera, which is like uh, it literally means poor cooking. It's it's not really so much about the people would eat it. It just it just the ingredients aren't expensive. Uh, it turns out like you know there's the whole Mediterranean diet, which I think is an awesome diet in general. Um, but when you go to veganize it, you end up with the you know a bunch of vegetables and grains and things that turn out to be what the the you know the peasants ate because they wouldn't afford the meat, uh, the cheeses, these expensive ingredients. So uh, it turns out there's a ton of like almost vegan as is recipes just in the world out there if you know how to find them in, the, in these like regional cuisines of italy um there are so many different interesting dishes just using all kinds of vegetables you might like the other day i bought a big huge bag of like uh turnip greens at the store because i i got a new i've been looking at this i have a book from uh, walter longo who's an italian guy himself it's called at longevity's table he's the, he's like the prolon diet guy um and I just found this like treasure trove of like 200 old regional Italian recipes uh, and a bunch of them used turnip greens because it's great food. Uh, so I anyway, bought that, made a, dealer, made, made a meal just using it. Um, so it's, it's just that idea. And there's lots of recipes that are like they designed to be like one is called like the chicken that got away, or the fish that got away. And they're recipes that are meant to mimic kind of these sort of traditional dishes, but without the meat for those who couldn't afford it. And uh, they turn out to be great vegan dishes. And like to me, it's it's like the, literally the healthiest food in the world. Way healthier than like green smoothies and all that stuff, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm all about the peasant cooking. I love it. The appropriate red wine, which is not maybe the healthiest choice, but I feel like it's not so unhealthy when you're matching it to the food it came from and just having a little bit. Uh, so that's that's one of the ways that I unwind. Love it. Everything in moderation, right? Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, to introduce you to the audience, uh, Matt Frazier is a New York Times bestselling author. He's a vegan ultra marathon runner and founder of the No Meat Athlete Movement. So I've been a big fan of Matt and his work ever since I went plant-based back in January 2020. And really got even more inspired uh, by everything that you're doing when you co-wrote the book, The Plant-Based athlete, which we got right here. So uh, as I mentioned off air, Robert Cheek, your uh, co-author, and I went pretty deep into that. But uh, and I don't feel like there's a huge need for us to go too deep into that. But what I am really curious about is this no me athlete movement, these businesses and uh, entrepreneurial endeavors that you've built out around that brand. So I'd really love to jump into your kind of entrepreneurial uh, founding origin story. So let's let's go there. When did all this stuff like begin? <laughs> uh, so I started Nomad Athlete in 2009, March 2009, and that's 14 years ago now. Uh, I can't believe it's been that long. I mean, it really just, it, I don't know. I feel like after about five years ago, it just, it all seems like it was five years ago. Uh, but I was, I was in graduate school. I was studying applied math, um, had my master's degree and I thought I was going to get my PhD and then go into teaching math. But I just knew I was like more entrepreneurial minded than that. I just wanted to do my own thing. It was hard for me to imagine just being a teacher. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It just wasn't for me. Um, and so this coincided with me, I was trying to qualify for the Boston marathon and gotten pretty close. I had taken 90 minutes off my first marathon time. You had to run a three, 10, three hours and 10 minute marathon, which was a seven minute and 15 second mile pace for a marathon. And I was like, not a runner when I started out trying to do this. Um, but I was like six years into that journey. I was within 10 minutes and like, suddenly I really wanted to go vegetarian for animals. I like just, I had a dog and like, I was reading these books about, uh, I mean, like Richard Dawkins books and some consciousness books uh, by like these neurology people. And like, I just like was like, wow, like animals and my dog, like they they feel things just like I do. And who am I to say that like I'm better than that or I deserve to eat that? So like I I can find a way to not eat that anymore. Um, Pigs, cows and like four legged animals. So I removed that from my diet. That worked fine with the running. But then it was like, should I give up the chicken 
and the fish and these things that I'm still thinking of as like my protein source for this marathon training. And I finally decided I'm just going to do it. Um, and that's when I said, I'll, I'll start a little blog about it. I was kind of into cooking even back then. So I said, I'll, it'll be interesting to document what food I'm having and just how it works with the training. Because this was 2009, like there wasn't the Ritual podcast and Brendan Brazier had, had just put out the Thrive books. I wasn't aware of them. He was the professional Ironman triathlete at the time. So he was doing big things. Scott Jurek was doing his ultra running thing as a vegan, but like ultra run, there was no born to run yet. So ultra running wasn't on anybody's radar. So like this was, this was new. And I Googled, like trying to find information for myself and like, I couldn't find anything. If I did, it was like incredibly like, uh, motivated by the ideological stuff. And which as much as that was my motivation, that wasn't what I wanted to share with people. I, I wasn't interested in like telling people you should do this or you shouldn't do this. Uh, I just wanted to share how it went. And so I couldn't find anything. So I was like, Hey, no meat athlete, that'd be great. And I just started writing blog posts. Um, and that in itself was kind of cool back then, right? People weren't making livings from blogs yet, or there weren't, there weren't influencers. It was just a different world. Um, so it was, it was a really fun, like few years of, of doing that and seeing it take off and, and all that. But then, yeah, that, that's how it began. And I, I kept going to grad school for probably six months, started putting out digital products eventually. And I was like, wow, like I, I could just do this full time, which my parents and my wife thought was like crazy that I would. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Like that was, was, it was weird to think that you could make a living out of this stuff. Um, but I went ahead and did it. And, and, you know, I think I did it too early. I should have like stuck with a good paycheck for a little longer. It would have been in hindsight better, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it worked out. So <laughs> all good now. So tell us about what were a couple of your first digital products that you were able to monetize? Okay. So I, I was all into like studying this stuff. And the only reason it succeeded, first of all, I was early in the space because there, there was no, there was no plant-based athlete. Like, and there, no one was saying plant-based either, by the way, it was a vegan athlete or vegetarian athlete. There weren't those blocks. So I was the first one doing it. That helped a ton. Um, but I was also studying lots of stuff, copy blog or all kinds of online, whatever you could find about it. Um, I was just obsessed with that. So I learned a little bit about search engine optimization, SEO, um, and like had one post that was from the born to run book. There were, they, the Taro Amara people ate this food called pinole, which is like a, uh, masa arena, like a corn, uh, meal basically. And they would use it and it was kind of hyped up as this like super food that enabled them to run all these hundreds of miles that they would do. And it, which isn't really true, but you know, the hype, uh, so I was getting all these, all this search traffic on one particular blog post about some recipes that I kind of made up using this to make it kind of practical for someone to use. Um, and so I was like, I could probably just make a product, like sell a recipe book just on that post. It has nothing to do with No Meat Athlete or the whole rest of the blog, really. It's just for people who like Google born to run Pinole and end up on this page. Like I could probably, you know, make some money from that and start paying for this thing. And, and that's what I did. And it worked pretty well. I, my, my sister helped me like come up with the recipes and I forget how much it was making, but it was, it was maybe making the 1500 bucks a month or something in the first like six or nine months. And I was like, this is, there's something here. Like you could, I, I could see the path then. I was like, I can find a way to make this real. So then I started thinking about how can I make stuff that's actually for the audience of people who trust me and doesn't depend on search, you know, converting a random search traffic person. Uh, and so I, I put out like a, a vegetarian guide to your first marathon. And I spent a long time, I, I consider that my first book, it was entirely self-published PDFs, all that stuff, extra bonus audio interviews, all these sort of things um, with the with the 3D images back then that were like all the, you, know, you saw a 3D image of a book. I was like, wow, this is awesome. And a bunch of people would always email and be like, when's my physical book arriving? And I was like, there's, there's, no, no, there's not a physical book. That was just a picture. Uh, but it was a great product. I thought it was awesome. It helped people who thought you couldn't do this stuff, just like I thought two years before that, thought you couldn't run races and do well on a vegetarian diet. Um, and I wasn't vegan yet. By the way, I did qualify for Boston 10, 10, no, six months after I went vegetarian, uh, which I totally didn't expect. Like I thought it was going to be a big hurdle to my training. And I, I think it made me faster. It, it allowed me, I think in hindsight, to not get injured when every other time, if I was training as hard as I did that summer, uh, an injury was, was sure to come and then set me back. So, uh, anyway, the, the book was all about that. And then like that worked great, did a little launch, you know, followed the product launch formula and all these other products out there. And then it worked great. And I was like, Hey, wait a minute, I could do the same exact thing for a half marathon and just like change some parts of the book, not, not to deceive anyone, but just like 
make it for a half marathon customer. And so I did that. And then once that worked too, I was like, this, like, I can just, this could be my job and I can, I can do that again and again and again. And that's when I quit grad school and, uh, you know, stop. My, my wife kept doing her job. She was a therapist. She kept doing that until we had our second child. Um, like I said, would have been good. I think if I kind of like kept the grad school thing going, kept the income, I probably would have made, been in a position to like, just make better business decisions in hindsight. Um, but you know, like I said, it worked out, so it's okay. Help me understand why you think you should have like, like gotten like a paycheck job. Um, like what, and the reason I'm digging into this is, you know, a lot of people who are interested in entrepreneurship, listen to my show. And uh, one of the things I really love to do is like empower them on their journey. And, uh, many people, you know, that are, uh, earlier on the path than you and I are going to run into this where they're like, uh, do I go get the safe job or do I, you know, just go full time on, you know, this entrepreneurial endeavor. So walk me through kind of like, you know, what you were thinking then and why, when you reflect on it, you think you should have maybe did it a little different. Yeah, it's a great question. And like, I should first qualify this by saying it did work out, right? And like for a lot of entrepreneurs, almost all entrepreneurs, it doesn't end up working out. It's just, it's just the numbers say that, right? So like, maybe I'm wrong to even question the approach I took because it worked and, and it's hard to make something work. So that being said, um, you know, I, I was so into the, I was just so eager to quit my job. Like that was the motivator for me to start this it was like, I don't want to work like for somebody else. I want to go be my own boss. I want to be, make my own decisions. And I want my wife not to have to work either. I just, I want to be free of all that stuff. And so like, that was such a motivating factor for me. And so my whole like consciousness at that time was around just getting to that level. Um, and so I got to that level as soon as I could. And, and I believed all the stuff that I read from like personal development, personal, like, you know, Tony Robbins types who were saying, burn the boats on the shores of the enemy. So you have no option to go back, right? Quit that old job. So you don't have a fallback. You're going to have to make your thing work then. And you'll make it work then because you have to. And, and I believe that. And, and it was true. It worked. Um, and maybe it wouldn't have otherwise, but what I found was like the thing that I made, I thought it was just going to be this thing where like, and before I was selling digital products, I was selling t-shirts. I, they, were, they just said, no made athlete. It was cool. It worked really well. People seemed to like that identity. It wasn't that profitable, but like it was great advertising. And it was my first like dollar I made online was just selling t-shirts. And so like, I did not have a big vision for this thing. I didn't think it was going to become one day a supplement company or that I'd have three books and more in the works. Um, and, and, you know, the sh numbers of people that it's not like Nomad Athlete is, is a, a giant site these days by any means. But as I said, in those early days when there wasn't as much competition and there weren't that many sites like it, it was it was pretty significant in terms of the traffic and all that stuff. And like there was a lot of people. I think we sold 40,000 shirts or something in the first, you know, handful of years. And like that was for this little thing. That was that was big numbers. So it, it became a movement of sorts. There was 200 running groups around the country or and the world, in fact, that were Nomad Athlete groups. And so like, none of this was in my mind at the beginning. I thought I was just like trying to like find some side gig that would allow me to get out of that corporate rat race thing and avoid all that. And so I was still in grad school, but I was just, we were talking about like what was, what was next. And it was seeming like go to like a, a lower tier four-year college and teach. Like that was the likely place I was going. And so I just wanted to escape that. And that's what I, like, that was some of my initial motivation in addition to wanting to share my stuff. And, but so like, as the opportunities became bigger and bigger, I kind of wished that I just had had a little more stable financial situation and not been in such a hurry to like cross that bridge and get to being full-time boss. Like it, and also I think once you do that, as soon as you make that decision, when you don't have that safety net anymore, like, yes, it's true. Now you don't have a safety net and you have to really go for stuff. Safety nets are also kind of good because they sometimes let you take risks that you can't take without a safety net. So I think as soon as you become a full timer, you're suddenly like subject to some of the same pressures as like a large company is where you can't do risky things that might upset the, the apple cart too much, right? You can't be quite as free to say whatever you want, even if that's the most effective thing. It's just a little scarier. And so I think a lot of creatives, Seth Godin, who I know you're a fan of, and I am as well, 
he writes about this sometimes that just this idea that like if, if you think of yourself as an artist um it's it, it's kind of hard to like do your best art and if we call this art what we do i don't know if you do or not but like it's hard to do that best art when when you're under financial pressure and if you can be on if you can have some safety you can allow yourself to do better art for a long time before you uh you know before you cut the cord so i'm not saying you shouldn't quit your job and just go for it because for some people you should um it's just it's just another perspective and in hindsight i think i think i could have done a, like i think our company now would be better had i waited longer to make it go full time you know cuz i wouldn't have had to take on some debt and things at different times to try to like keep it going cuz there was some tough years in those beginning after the you know initial fee years like pump were off i was like wow what do we do now and then i had to take on more debt to grow stuff or to hire someone it's so, like it was just would have been nicer to have a have a little more solid foundation yeah i actually am in full alignment with you i i i deeply believe like keep the safe corporate job just make Mm -hmm. sure you have one that gives you enough time and energy uh on the side to like pursue the entrepreneurial uh endeavor so that way you can exactly what you're saying like go at a pace that is sustainable make decisions that are optimized for overall life quality Cause you mentioned that there was like some stressful times, like I'm sure around kind of like money with, you know, your, your wife and your family and yep. like financial stress is, is like one of the worst types of stress. Um, and, and it's not a fun place to be in. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that took off, you know, we'll probably talk about longevity at some point. I'm sure that probably <laughs> took some years off of your life being that yeah, stressed probably. out. Yep. Um, so I'm not actually a fan of burn the boats at all even though i'm a huge fan of tony robbins like he was kind of like my first uh you know personal development self-improvement person that i got introduced to at a very very young age um but i just i don't believe in that i think there's another way that is a lot more um likely to work out in the long run a lot less stressful and will ultimately you know ensure that kind of the, your personal life and family life are uh, in intact and not like broken by the entrepreneurial pursuit. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And so and so perhaps the, the, the burning the boat strategy makes more sense when you're single and, and maybe the younger you are too, the better. Um, but yeah, I, I, had, I just got married. And in fact, a year after Nomadathic came out, my son was born. So it was like having, it was like two, two babies, right? Cause the, the blog, like it was all consuming. It was all I thought about all the time. And then suddenly baby and like that changes everything. So I think certainly that plays a part like that, that cir- those circumstances to me, I think you know, I would have had a lot less time, but uh, I don't know. I think, I think it could have worked out the other way too. Yeah. Well, the good news is that it did work out. But yep. I really love your advice because I think, unfortunately, I think there's a bit of like hype and culture around like, oh, just like drop everything and follow your passion. And, you know, that's kind of like that messaging is very in vogue, but that doesn't work for like, I would say 95% of people that just, that doesn't work. Like they have a mortgage, they have children, they're supporting, uh, you know, family members. Uh, they're just not in a position where they can do that. So yeah, I really, right. I, I actually am really glad you have brought this up because um, similar to you, I just, I just believe there's another path. Like you don't have to burn the bridges uh, and, or the boats, and you can actually create sustainability as you pursue, you know, a higher calling or a passion or entrepreneurial endeavor. Yep. Be- before you went to grad school, did you work in a corporate job, like in between undergrad and grad, or did you go straight through undergrad into grad? Yeah, I had kind of a weird situation. I, I majored in uh, finance and then started working for like, I don't know, two years or something. I had like a music industry job, waiting tables job, and then a financial you know, asset management company job. Um, but as I was doing that, I was like, wow, like i I majored in the wrong thing because I found out, I realized that I really liked the mathematical side of all that stuff and that I should have been taking different courses. I should have been like a quantitative finance person and like had to take the calculus courses that I just didn't have to take as a, as a regular finance major. So I, I went back 
started going back to like undergrad and I took two years of undergrad math to get to math, to get into math grad school. Uh, so I was, I was working during a lot of that and then, then moved into like full-time grad school. Yeah. The, so you and I share a, a similar background. I used to work in investment banking. Um, oh, yeah? Okay. yeah. And I was like, I got to get out of this cause this is not the lifestyle that I want to live. Right, um, right. it's just like, I was like, this is not a life that is going to make me happy. So yeah, now I kind of understand why you were like, <laughs> I, I want to do the entrepreneur thing. Cause like finance it's for some people, it's great. Like, but I would say for most people, it's like they do it for the money or the safety or the security or, or, you know, both. Um, and, uh, but you can make a lot of money in finance. So it's not a, it's not a bad path, uh, right. for some, right. um, yep. so I love to hear that. All right. So you build out uh, kind of the no meat brand. You have some initial digital products. Uh, you're selling t-shirts. Um, you're starting to write more and more. Help me understand how you started these other endeavors. Like you have a supplement company, you have a uh, at-home testing, uh, you know, you know, for your biomarkers. Like help me understand like how and when did that come into play because this has been a 14 year entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I met my partner, Matt Tolman. Um, I think it was about maybe seven years or so into the Nomad athlete journey. And by that point, uh, a, a lot of like the, like, I don't know the cranking out content. It turned out wasn't sustainable. Uh, for me, it was for a few years and I, and I really did a lot of it, but then like, I, it started out posting every day for, I don't know, first two, three months. And then it turned into posting twice a week. And then it was once a week. And then it was, it was getting to the point where it was like once a month. And I just could not get myself to write another protein article, despite what all my analytics and research said was like, people want to know about protein. Like no matter how intelligent something might be or what kind of pop-ups I could offer, like the one that works is the protein cheat sheet. And it was like, God, I just can't keep doing the same thing. Uh, so had there been AI back then, maybe I would have had a different strategy and like just found ways to let the AI write a slightly different version of the protein article. Uh, but it didn't. And so I like, couldn't keep doing it. So tried to hire writers, tried to make the brand not be about me. Um, which I guess is kind of a, um, well, I don't know if it was a mistake or not, but like, I, I always intended the brand to be one that wasn't about me. That wasn't the point when I, when I called it no meat athlete, it was not supposed to be Hey, I'm the no meat athlete and that's my personality, like all that. But it turned out that's what people want, right? That they wanted is like, say, this is that this person doing this is the person who that's about. It's all about the face. Um, I like, I used to give a bunch of talks and things and would often get introduced by people who didn't know as like professional athlete, professional vegan athlete, Matt Frazier. And I was like, this is like, that, that's awful. Like, I don't want people to think that I'm up here like, a pro athlete and giving them advice. Like, this is just me. I just kind of figured some of this stuff out and I was, I was a recreational athlete and it, it worked, but it, it's not like that was competing at the highest levels, but it's just this thing. People just want to like, you know, they just want that face of their brand. So that proved to be a challenge that I think I wasn't prepared for and never really could like fully escape it. So this opportunity came up when I met Matt, um, he and I just went out to dinner and we're talking and like, we both had like put together our own, homemade cocktail of vitamins basically because we both were like super into research super into the nutrition stuff um and by the way just like with the pinole thing my very best uh you know the things i've done best that turned out to be really important for me along the way it was whenever i like nerded out went into some kind of niche topic sought out my own solution like making up pinole recipes because i couldn't find them anywhere um, and then, and similar here, just like started having a combination of six different supplement bottles I would take because I didn't want a whole multivitamin because I didn't believe that I needed that. I was getting this huge, varied diet of all kinds of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and grains and beans. And I was like, I don't need vitamin C or, or, you know, vitamin E in my diet. I'm getting plenty of these things, but I do need B12 and I do need D and I'm pretty sure I need DHA and EPA unless the blood testing would reveal otherwise that I can convert ALA into those things. And most people can't, um, and, and there were more. And so I was just taking them all. And Matt, Matt was doing the same thing over in, in, I think he was in Dallas at the time. And I was in, on the East coast and we were like, well, we should just make a product that like puts this all into one thing. And that'll make it a lot easier for vegans and for us and our families. So that's, that's exactly what compliment was and became. Um, 
So it wasn't like I just set out to do a, a supplement company. That wasn't really ever a goal of mine, but because like I had lost the interest in like trying to make myself into an influencer, which by the way, and this may be interesting or, or not, I don't know. Around the same time, I had like come to the, the conclusion that if I kept trying to do the influencer path and the, all that came with it, which was like thinking I was awesome, being told I was awesome sometimes, having people line up to get their books signed by me and me feeling like I was on top of the world because I got that. And then realizing there's someone online who was doing it better than me and had bigger, bigger numbers, a uh, New York Times bestseller, which I didn't have at the time, uh, better podcast, wh whatever. Like that comparison and all that, I was like, I, I, if I do this, I'm going to destroy my happiness and my family and life. And like, I'm just going to be a miserable person. So I, I really made a very conscious effort. And in fact, went to a Tony Robbins event with like the, the goal of saying, I'm going to eliminate this at this event. And I really, I think it really did do that for me. Um, just like, completely getting rid of that that drive for significance, which is like one of his like six human needs that he says will destroy your life if that's your primary driving thing. Um, and I think I had come to the same conclusion and like, thank God that I, that I was able to get rid of that because it really helped me a lot. So at that time, I was like, wow, I can start a supplement company. That doesn't require me to like be the face and the person out there hawking these things. And I some people, that's how they do their supplement company is keep that influencer personality. But this seemed like a way I could sort of like, be a little bit more of an entrepreneur without having to be like the center of, of attention. I just said like, that's just not, it's just not going to make me happy if I have to keep doing that. I love that. This is so good because a yeah. lot of people want to be the brand. They want to, they want to create a brand around themselves. And I would be lying and saying like, I, I'm not currently doing that and, and don't, uh, uh, I'm, this is really timely because I've been thinking a lot about this as well as, is because one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, just to put context to it is, you know, my brand right now is fit rich life. And what does that mean when I'm 70? Right? <laughs> like, uh, like, and, and, I believe fitness uh, definitions can evolve over time, but I, I really been starting to think through that because, you know, now I'm solidly in my forties. I am 41, right? So at some point I'm going to hit, hit my like peak physical fitness. And then it's going to be like a decline on the other side. And I, I still think I have a few years before I hit my peak, but at some point I'm going to have to start coming down. So I've been thinking in my own sense, like I got to make sure the brand and myself isn't just about like aesthetic physical fitness. Mm -hmm. Like it has to be like so much more than that and being like uh, sustainably fit at all ages throughout your entire life. But I really, I love that you actually bring this up because I think very few people even have the self-awareness that by like kind of chasing this like significance um, as like an influencer or the face of a brand can you know really destroy as you said your happiness um so i love that you brought this up i'm curious which tony robbins event was it was it unleash the power within or was it another one so i actually did go to and unleash the power within and then and then later a couple more but that's when i went to to the first upw was actually i came home from that and said i'm gonna make the vegetarian thing work and i'm gonna become an entrepreneur that's actually when i started nomad athlete i didn't mention that earlier but I, prior to that, I just thought the vegetarian would be kind of a um, like a health sacrifice. I just thought I could do it for animals and I'd like to, but I was worried about my health and I was so motivated by health that I thought it wouldn't work. And at Tony's event, he actually promotes a, like a pescatarian diet. And I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to try it and be all energetic because he, he wants you to have more energy and all that. So that's when I said, I'm going to go for it. And then I came up from that and I was all excited. So that's when I started the blog as well. So that'll happen then. This was uh, his date with destiny event. That's where I really, uh, it just goes much deeper. It's like six days and it's all him. And it's just, it's intense, emotional. I mean, I, it was, it's great. There's a, there's a Netflix documentary about it. Uh, yep. If you're into that stuff, if you're not into that stuff, you'll hate it. You watch that and you're like, this guy's a cult leader. This is terrible. <laughs> uh, and, and I get it. It's not for everybody, but it, it really has helped me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not your guru is the documentary, uh, which is good. I still think it doesn't like I've been to Tony Robbins events. I've like, you know, read all of his books. I'm a huge fan. I think that documentary doesn't do a full service to just like, uh, how awesome, uh, he is and how, 
like as long as you don't get i don't know what the the word i'm i'm looking for but you know no matter who it is or what program it is and like i don't know if you're familiar with landmark um mm-hmm. which is like another personal development like workshop it's okay. like a weekend workshop and uh unfortunately it's a great weekend workshop but unfortunately they're like part of their mission is to get everyone to do the landmark forum. Uh, so they like really push all the people to get other people to sign up. And it's uh, like, it's almost to the point where it's like really uncomfortable and not okay. cool. But like, fortunately when I, when I went to that, my brother had already done it and he's like, yo, the program's really good, but they're going to really like push you to get other people to sign up. Just like, don't pay attention to that. Don't be stressed about it. You don't mm-hmm. need to sign anyone up. Just take all the good content and all the good information and experience and like take that and it'll transform your life. And that's what I did. I wasn't stressed about signing anyone up. I literally didn't ask anyone to join. I was just <laughs> like, wow, there's so much good content in this. And it really did improve my life. And so I, I, I would say with anything, Tony Robbins Landmark Forum, it's like, there's always massive amounts of gold, but there is going to be parts of it that are like not a good fit or like don't feel good. But that doesn't mean Tony Robbins is terrible or Landmark is terrible. It just right. means like it's their business to generate more business. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to take all of it. And it goes with other stuff too, right? Like I think I think you have the same view of diet as I do. Like uh, a vegan diet is awesome. I love being vegan, but like you might be able to be healthier being almost vegan, right? Or, or maybe 100%. the same healthy, or maybe not quite. I don't really know. It depends how you do it. But like, I don't know. You, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I, I'm, I see articles now and then, not many, that are about eating more fruits and vegetables and about how healthy it is. And they like manage to just sidestep the whole diet fighting of like whether you should be vegan or whether you should be a carnivore diet person. <laughs> And it's like, you don't have to pick one. Just You can just kind of eat a whole lot of fruits and vegetables. And then like with the other 20% of your diet, eat whatever makes you happy. Um, and and you can be pretty healthy that way. So I don't know. I, I think it's a good lesson in general is like, you can take little bits and things. You don't need to go all in on every every single thing to get value out of it. 100% agree. Yeah. And, and you and I are same philosophy. I choose to be vegan because, you know, ultimately is an ethical choice. Um mm-hmm you know, similar to you, like, I just like, if I can prevent the suffering of other living beings, uh, through the way I live life, why not? You know, and I can be just as fit as I want to be. I can enjoy food just as much as I want to enjoy food. So for me, it's an easy choice, but I understand like for some people that's, uh, you know, going, you know, completely plant-based just seems impossible. And, uh, you know, I'd much rather people just incorporate more plants into their life because it's going to improve their health. It's going to improve their longevity. It's better for the environment and it's better for all living beings. Now, uh, like they don't need to go hardcore vegan. Like that's not my goal to get everyone to go hardcore vegan. I just think people going more plant-based, um, would be great for all parties involved. Um, yeah. I just like to, and, but, and for me, I know I'm kind of like a little bit of like an extremist. Like I like just cause I, I like, I like being vegan. Like I like being mm-hmm. at the extreme end of something, but yeah. that doesn't mean I need other people to be there with me. Right. Um, so and I think that's really important. I think we need more of that in, in the vegan or plant-based movement. Uh, more people who don't need everyone else to be vegan, but right. Yeah. And, and spread the message in, in a way that's. I don't know, just a little more inclusive. And, and I think it makes the whole thing seem more attractive than, than when it seems like this all or nothing thing. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I really like the idea of making it more inclusive. Um, that like, I literally rebranded my coaching program from fit rich vegan to fit rich life because I was like, hmm. the world doesn't need more vegans to be more vegan. The world and its people could really use more people going more plant-based. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the potential of of changing a whole lot of animal lives and environment and health isn't by creating, you know, 10 times more vegan. It's, it's, it's creating 100 or 1,000 times more people who, who eat mostly plant-based diets. I and mean, I think that's where, that's where the potential is. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, this is kind of dovetailing perfectly into two of those, you know, areas that we want to cover, which is longevity and diet culture. So let's, uh, let's dive a little bit more into, to diet culture. Um, you know, let's talk a little, like, I know you're really kind of looking at this right now. There's, and anyone who pays any attention to social media, there's, you know, the carnivore diet, there's, uh, the vegan diet, there's, you know, whatever the other diets are that are super in fat and, you know, in a few years, you know, before it used to be low carb and then it was, uh, you know, Atkins and like, there's always some sort of diet, uh, war culture conflict going on. So I would love to just kind of hear your thoughts about like where we're at and maybe some paths forward to more inclusivity. Yeah, I, it, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, uh, Matt Tolman and I are, are hoping to write a book soon about like just this general topic. We haven't really shared that many places yet, and it's not definite yet, but we're just thinking about it a lot, reading a lot about it and all this stuff. Um, and it, it's shocking, you know, how how this culture of, of influencers and there's tribalism that goes on, of course. There's the, the incentive to the person teaching it is not in the correct direction, which to me is the one that says like, you don't have to do this all the way or be more extreme to make this work well. Uh, the incentive is to make your content the most extreme. I look, at, look at YouTube where just like, whoever can do the wackiest, most extreme stuff wins. The same thing happens with the diet stuff. It's like whoever can you know eat only animal organs or whatever, or, or show pictures of them with blood because they killed the animal with their bare hands. Like that just, it just gets people to, want to see it uh and so like that's kind of weird and i'm not saying the vegan side isn't you know doing the exact same thing there are people who then go raw and there are people who uh you know fruitarian and like i've tried these things they're they're fun i, I like trying them i don't think most of them are sustainable for long-term health or the best path um but like even just regular vegan like there's a, a lot of messaging and pressure like certainly i i I always try to, I thought of myself as someone who at least was aware of this and like tried not to be biased in the stuff that I would share. I tried to be scientific, but surely I wasn't as likely to retweet a mention I saw of a pro meat study that happened that turned out red meat's not that bad for you. You know, I just wasn't going to share that to my audience the way I would if it said, turns out meat is worse for you than we thought, right? Like I'm going to retweet that one regardless of the merit that science has. It just, it fits my brand. And it's just what I need to do. And you can't criticize people within the brand. I mean, you could, but if you do that, then you're sort of making your own, you're creating a little schism and you're making your own branch of that and you're going to your own extreme. So like that stuff happened. So people, as a result of all that stuff, people get more and more convinced that the one path that the influencer they found is saying is the only one. It's, it's the right one. It's the only one. And I know like, I went a long time with being vegan. Only recently have I started looking at health numbers and, and my company by the way which i guess i don't need to disclose i'm not not really advertising our thing but like we we do a thing where you can get at home testing and then get your supplements uh adjusted accordingly based on what your numbers say but i've personally mostly not done much of that testing uh on my own until recently and partly because we're doing it as a company now um but like i'm not as healthy as i thought i was it was it was really easy for me to buy the idea over all this time that like well my diet's gonna just protect me from everything. And like, I'm not going to have to deal with heart disease, even though I have a family history of it. And I'm not going to have to deal with cancer, right? And there's certainly the vegans out there who will tell you vegan diet prevents cancer in all forms, uh, which is wrong, of course. Um, but I just, I just, it was easy to be lazy. And it was easy for me to say like, well, I used to be more of an athlete than I am now, but thankfully I still eat this healthy diet. And that probably is all I really need. So it's okay if I go two years and don't really move very much during that period. Um, and I, you know, I just, it's, 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 it's dangerous. It can be dangerous to, to sort of what, what the effect of all this happened, right? So like, I just sort of started thinking of this diet as made me not have to worry about my health. And that's not true. That's, it's not responsible to be that way. And it's really not responsible to teach that to people. So, and, and of course the others, all the diets do it. This is, this is just what happens. Um, I, and I'm really of the belief now that like, no matter which of these diets we're talking about, if you would move it a little closer to the average of all these diets, you'd probably be better off, right? Because the more extreme you go, the more likely you're going to be missing something. 
And then you need to take supplements to correct for it, which is why we started this vegan company. I said exactly the problem that I was having. Um, so I just, I don't know. I just think, I think the path to longevity is one that is really not nearly as like hard as any of these diets make it seem. Uh, but that's what the forces kind of do. So if you look at like the blue zones research, right, it paints this very compelling picture of like a diet that seems pretty easy to eat. It's a Mediterranean diet. They incorporate exercise into their life by gardening and walking on hilly terrain. Uh, they do it a lot of hours, but it's not like they're in the gym grinding it out or having to put hours and hours a day into, you know, keeping their body in great shape. Uh, it just happens because it's just part of their life and they have, and they relax and there's social stuff and there's purpose and there's all this stuff that like all of it is like, I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have more of that in my life. And these are the things that help people live the longest. So it's like this idea that we need to sacrifice or go to extremes to have extremely good health. Um, I think it's just wrong, but people don't have the patience to like, you know, adopt a diet like that because it's not going to, it's not going to make you lose 30 pounds in the first two months, you know? So that's still what wins um, is, is that kind of messaging. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm really, so just begun to think about this in the past couple of month, months. Um, but I, I think, I think there is a path for more, more things like the blue zones approach to longevity. Um, and I think, I think the blue zones maybe is a little too loose. I think they're like, you know, they, they, they hype up how much you can drink wine. Uh, and as much as I like wine and wish I could drink it all the time, as much as, you know, in a glass two a day, uh, it's probably not healthy to do that. It's probably caps out about five per week is like really where it becomes no longer a positive or neutral and into a, a negative. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think you can be a little more restrictive, a little more hands-on than the blue zones approach, get the blood work done, figure out where your, you know, where your, you know, DNA is making you susceptible to different diseases. Like whether you're more likely to have metabolic dysfunction or whether you're more likely to have uh, cardiovascular problems or whether you've got a big cancer risk, like you can figure out which one, of those big killers is going to, you know, likely get you or Alzheimer's, of course, is another one. And then you can do things that are, that are aimed at that, that are targeted. You can pick a lifestyle within several groups that are, you know, more defined than the, the kind of the blue zone sort of hands-off thing. Um, so anyway, that's, it's, that's about as concrete as my ideas are on there. But, uh, but yeah, I just think it's crazy the, the place we've gotten ourselves to um, with this, with this diet world and this internet. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's related to this that I've been thinking about a lot, actually, I believe I heard um, Peter Atia talk about it, is there's all these, you know, different diets. There's the, uh, you know, or f there's fasting, there's uh, tracking your macros, there's uh, carnivore, there's, you know, like vegan, like, and all these things. And they're all kind of getting at the same thing, which is like, eating either the same amount of calories that you burn or eating less to create a calorie deficit in order to lose the body fat that you uh, could lose to improve your health. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and yep. it's, it's like, cause if you cut out an entire, like suddenly you don't eat, you know, and you know, I'll start with the vegans. If you suddenly don't eat, you know, meat and dairy, you're most likely just going to consume less calories in a particular day because meat and dairy are very calorically dense. Right. right. But yep. then there's plenty of like, you know, junk food vegans who they just eat a ton of processed food and they don't experience that improved, you know, health, uh, and, and fitness and weight loss because they're still getting massive amounts of calories. Same thing with the carnivore. If you suddenly cut out all grains and everything, but literally, you know, like meat, like it's kind of hard to like overeat on like all meat. Cause like, you're just going to be like, all right, I'm, I've had enough. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's and a good thing with fasting, right? When you fast, I mean, it may not be some miracle of your, of your system resetting. It may just be that you're not eating as much. And if you put your life, yeah, <laughs> that that's literally what it is. As far as I understand from the science that I've uh, looked into, it's literally just leads people to eat less in a given day. So they get more fit because they drop the body fat that their body doesn't need. Um, yeah. So they're all their health markers improved. Now, of course, there probably is some sort of uh, benefits at some point, because obviously humans were designed to fast because you know, back when we were not as civilized as we are, we, there would be periods of times where we just didn't have much food and we would not eat. So we were literally designed to do it. Now, 
I, even though I'm a big proponent of intermittent fasting, like I don't do it every single day, year round after year. Like I, I use it as a tool for my fitness, but it's one of many tools in my toolbox, my fitness toolbox. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes like if I can tell, Hey, my body needs to eat, I'll break my fast like six hours earlier than I need to. And I'll even just take some months off fasting to kind of like let my body experience the other end of the spectrum where I'm not fasting at all. Um, yep. and I think you and I are just kind of the same. It's like, let's come back a little bit more to the middle, uh, you know, not be so extremist all the time. It's fun and interesting to go extreme at times, but to like, think that is the only way for the rest of your life. That's just going to like, you know, cause a lot of issues for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I like your book with fasting. I think, uh, I think in general, like we should have more randomness in the way we eat. Um, because going back again, like when we were way less civilized, there were a lot of, like, it was, it was feast or famine, right? You you, you had no food for a while. And then suddenly you had a whole bunch of food for a week or a three day period and you just feasted. And so like when people have this fasting regimen that they never change, you're kind of just creating your own, you know, new version of an unnatural situation, uh, that, that your body probably wasn't designed to do. Like it's, and I don't know, there's, there's lots of different thought about how how best to work this stuff into your diet. I've heard the idea that when we have protein, it's actually better than like, you know, some people would imagine that if you could have an IV hooked up to you to drip in exactly the right amount of food, like every second over the course of the day, that would be best, but it's probably not the best. It's probably better to get 30 grams of protein in one meal. Uh, and that's, you know, that would be a large part of a lot of vegans daily protein, but there's evidence that would suggest that like having a whole bunch at once makes sense because that's how, that's how we're probably meant to do it. And so like, I see a lot of these new, I, I've thought about this stuff as well, this, this personalized nutrition stuff, technology is suddenly allowing us to do, you know, things we've never, ever been able to do when it comes to nutrition, being able to see numbers and data in real time that we've never seen before. Like, and what's happening, there's a company called Elo Health that has like smart protein now, where it hooks up to your app on your iPhone and like, it knows based on your workout difficulty and all this stuff, exactly the right amount of protein that you need as a result of that workout. And I'm like, that, like, that's just totally unnatural. Like we're not meant to like have exactly the amount of protein that based on that you're meant to just have, you know, the meal after the workout. So I just think like there's this overfitting thing and we're going to see tons of companies doing this stuff where like there's a stuff that sounds like a good story, but has zero basis in actual, you know, biology or history as far as what's healthy for us. So um, those are problems I'm thinking a lot about and how do how do you like, wh where's the line? How can people like, make good decisions in the face of all this. I mean, it's so, we talked about blood testing. It's so easy to go down the rabbit hole and like start trying to correct numbers that maybe don't need to be corrected, right? Like I saw a good article the other day about blueberries causing someone's real time uh, continuous glucose monitoring. They showed a blood sugar spike when they ate blueberries. And some companies, some personalized nutrition companies were saying, here's a great example of why this person shouldn't eat blueberries because it makes their blood sugar spike. When a lot of people who know more, more than I do about this stuff are saying, it's very possible like your blood sugar is supposed to spike like that when you have blueberries and like your body's doing exactly what it should to, you know, take in this food that's incredibly rich in lots of things and sugar and energy. And like, it's a great food for you. You don't need to have a perfectly smooth blood sugar line the entire time. Um, and so like, I, I really think we can get in there too much and like over optimize stuff that's not meant to be optimized. And then you know, let's say that person does remove blueberries. So now they do have a good flat glucose line. Uh, what about the other parts of their body that now don't benefit from having had those blueberries uh, or down the road if they've, you know, stopped eating that fruit? I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting. And we've never had to deal with these kinds of problems before. So uh, I think there's a lot of pitfalls that we will need to be, uh, be on the lookout for. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of m metabolic flexibility, right? I want to be able to fast when it's convenient, right? Or when it works for me, I want to be able to not fast when I'm like, you know, in a situation where it maybe isn't the best or my body, it can literally just feel it being like, Hey, you should probably eat and, mm -hmm. and getting in tune to what my body actually needs and what the current circumstance or environment or time period I'm in needs and, and being very flexible with that and in tune 
not only my life or my body, but my life, uh, you know, and where I'm at in my life, et cetera. So that's why I love, like, again, I think, I think being able to fast is a tool, uh, and it, and if used appropriately, it, it will improve your metabolic flexibility. Right. Yep. So, you know, if you're in an environment where all the food is like hyper processed and like deleterious to your, to your, your health, like, Great time to fast, yeah. right? Yeah. But at yeah. the same time, I'm of the proponent 80 to 90% of the time, you know, whole food plant-based, but 10 to 20% of the time, enjoy the processed food, have fun, live a rich life, right? Yep, yep, but yeah. And I mean, if your food is causing you stress, uh, right, to eat it, if our diet's causing you stress to eat it, then certainly there's a, there's a small loss of health, at least from the stress. There's certainly a loss of happiness and just well-being because <laughs> yeah. you're feeling stress from eating. So- like, yeah, I mean, if, if for you eating 10 to 20% of your calories, not whole foods, makes you happy and able to continue doing this for years and years and years, I mean, that's so much better than someone being perfect and then quitting after six months because they just, it's just too far. Like you- yeah. The other thing that I think this sets people up w- with is when they go super extreme when they then fall off the perfect train, they go nuts. They like this, like, it's like, oh, like I never eat processed food. And then like, they actually have some and then they just like, okay, I'm ordering, you know, like Pizza Hut and, you know, Snickers bars. And I'm just going to go nuts because I fell off the train. Yep. I mean, that's a, that is a huge thing is perfectionism problem. Uh, the habit change research has made this abundantly clear that like trying to be perfect uh, it just doesn't work. It's just, it's just not the best way to change at all because of exactly what you said. Um, so if you've got an outlet where like, it's okay to like perfect, you can still look perfect to you because your perfect is defined as there's a little bit of, you know, stuff that isn't on the diet in there or whatever. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways to get around like the, the things called the two day rule or the don't miss twice rule, right? If you've got a workout streak going, and like, it's okay to miss every now and then, but just when you do miss, that's when like the alarm bell should go off and say, tomorrow I absolutely have to do it again because I don't miss twice in a row. Um, that's a way of building in like tolerating imperfection and still feeling like you're kind of perfect in this different way, right? On this on this different streak that allows you to miss once here and there, whatever. Um, and that's the way people need to eat, honestly. It really is the way. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's, it's not going to ever move you towards weight loss goals or whatever as fast as really extreme. You have to be perfect. Never miss diets. Um, but, but that patience, and this goes for all kinds of habit change. If people could be more patient in, in the result, understand that there are changes being happening in your brain and to your willpower and to the way you can, you know, resist temptation, like you can get stronger at that for sure. That, that's known. Um, if you can understand that you're making changes there to this, to this wiring, even before you see those changes on the outside, uh, a lot of the problems go away. You just have to have more patience. And it's, and I, I understand that it's hard because it's tempting. Whenever I want to change, I want that result right away. Like I just want to go for it. But gradually I'm learning that that doesn't work today very well. Um, and really what I'm learning is, is more, not that I don't still go for it, but it's like when I do inevitably fall off that perfection train, which always happens, I've stopped saying like, oh, I guess it didn't work. Or I guess I'm bad at making changes because of whatever happened in childhood, right? I'm just blame whatever. Um, you say, okay, that approach didn't work. So now I can try one that's more based on the habit change science and I can try a more gradual approach. And instead of trying to run 45 minutes a day, starting tomorrow, every single day, I'm going to start with five minutes tomorrow. And if I can make it a whole week of that, I'll let myself start doing 10 minutes the next week. And then after that, you know, whatever. So I, I just think like, Go for it if, if you want to, but then realize there is another, but you didn't just fail and you're done. You just have to try a different way now. Yeah. Yeah. hundred um, percent. It, it really makes me think like everyone wants, like if someone's on like a, a, a weight loss journey, they want their weight loss uh, graph to go like perfectly straight down. Just like over time, there's it only goes down. But the truth is all weight loss is very spiky. Like it goes, it goes down some, it'll bump up a little bit. It'll like go down some more. It'll bump up even higher than like that last, you know, bump up. And 
nothing it doesn't matter that's just normal all that matters is like are you trending in the right direction right because we all have this crazy variable in you know our fitness journey called life <laughs> you get sick uh work goes nuts and you just have to work a lot more for a week than normally so uh you got terrible sleep so your hunger is like through the roof so you like overeat and then the next day you weigh more than you did the the previous day and i think what we're both getting at is um having more compassion for being a human who has an real life yep i mean yeah i mean there's so much just there like that that's that's an example of the data right having too much data kind of leading us straight if you didn't have that scale and i'm not saying that a scale is bad or that data is bad because it is it is good it lets us do things but like if you just didn't check your weight you might not know that you gained a pound on day eight of your thing and you wouldn't have gotten discouraged because you would have just noticed the general trend downward uh so i mean it's a good example of of sort of what can happen with with that stuff um yeah. And the other one, I have blanked on what it was. So we'll it's okay. I have uh, something that, I, so related to longevity, health is sleep, right? And I, there's so much information and, and kind of promotion that like, you got to get eight hours every night if you want to be like optimal health. And I read this great book um, by, uh, I forget his first name, it's called Sleep. Um, and then it had some subtitle. Uh, by Little Hills. I'll put a link in the show notes. But basically, uh, he works with a bunch of elite athletes like across the world. And athletes, like they have to travel and their sleep gets fucked up. Like, and mm -hmm. so for them to get perfect eight hours a night is like very challenging. So he made the argument that in a given week, you need to average a certain number of sleep cycles. Like a, one cycle is like usually 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and some people need an average of five or six cycles per night. Some people only need three or four. And so he really is the proponent of literally test, see kind of what your optimal number of uh, cycles are. Be totally okay that some nights you just... Like plenty of nights, I can't sleep more than three cycles. My body's just like, nope, let's get up. But then mm -hmm. there's like this mental programming, especially, you know, I wear a lot of trackers. That's like, oh, you only got like 65% yep. of your sleep needs. So then like my mind wants to be like, oh, you don't, you probably aren't going to feel very good today. And oh. when I read that book, I, I, I was like, oh, wait, this is like very normal. Right. And like research and studies have shown like prior to the industrial age, like humans were biphasal sleepers. Yep. Like we slept yep. in like and if you put they've done studies, if you put someone in like a room where there's no like uh, you can't see outside. So you don't know if it's light or dark outside and there's no clocks, people will sleep in two shifts. Okay, and wow. so for me, <laughs> like I'll have a couple nights where I get less cycles and then I'll take like a two or three on hour nap and catch like bump my average back up and sometimes yeah. that means like i'm working really hard and like you know there's a lot of like pressure or stress in life and i'm just not sleeping as much so maybe two days in a row i take like two 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 hour naps and again that's like uh not just like metabolic flexibility but like health flexibility right Yep. Um, well-being yep. flexibility, like, okay, I didn't get eight hours of sleep. Do I feel okay? Yeah, I feel okay. Cool. I might need a nap this afternoon and like, I'll carve out some space to do that. And yeah. I think people get so stressed just about not getting eight hours of sleep that that affects their health and well-being more than the lack of actual sleep. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's perfect. It, it speaks to like, life is random and lumpy, right? There's lumpiness in how we get stuff. Just because we're supposed to get to sleep, it doesn't mean you need it exactly every night. I've gone through the same exact sleep tracker saga that you have. I, I realized it was doing damage to me, causing me too much stress. And, and I got off it just, and every now and then I'll use it again to, to check in and see stuff. But like, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's better if you can let stuff happen. And I remembered as you were talking, cause you, this is another example. You said we, we need to be like, be human. Like, being more human is is the answer to all of this stuff, the diet, the fitness, the sleep, right? The social stuff. Like if you do things that humans are like meant to do, uh, it's, it's actually way, way easier than like 
all these like basically it's just and that all ends up usually being you remove stuff instead of you add new stuff on right instead of adding in the sleep tracker and adding in the sleep schedule or whatever so that now you hit exactly this sleep schedule uh, if, if you can instead like remove that and just let your body tell you when you're tired and when you're not tired and be okay with that it's great same with food you mentioned the same thing right like you some people will get very stressed if there's no food for them to eat at a at a meal or a day or whatever Whereas you're saying, well, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and fast during that period, which is probably the natural reaction. When there wasn't food available, you just wouldn't eat. People freak out because they're like, well, I had to, I have to get my protein and my carbohydrate ratio exactly right at this day. Like what? I can't miss a, a whole meal. But like, it, that's just artificial. We're just putting numbers on top of stuff and pretending like we know exactly how it's supposed to be. And it's, it's just not like our bodies just don't work that way. They're not designed that way. So it sounds like easy. It sounds like, oh, just listen to your body. That's good. But what I'm, as I've thought about this a lot more, I'm like, you can't just tell people that. Like, it's not, we're kind of in a privileged place, you and I, and most people listening to this, I'm sure diet wise, just having thought about this, done this for a long time, you can get there and you can understand what it feels like to like have your taste buds change over time. And you actually start to crave better foods. Like most people can't imagine what that is like. So you can't really say, and the same with sleep, right? People, there are people, no doubt about it, maybe they don't need exactly eight hours every night. But there are people whose sleep is completely dysfunctional because the schedule they've put on themselves prevents them from sleeping right. So you can't tell that person, like, just listen to your body and, like, sleep when you need to and take the nap when you need to. But, like, because they might not have time for a nap. So it's like I'm trying to find, like, what is the solution? How can you tell people the di- this diet advice that's about being more human but in a way that people can actually use and, like, has some little bits of what people like about the influencer, you know, the diet culture that has those little hooks that pull people in. Uh, I don't know. So that, that's, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. How, how can you help people do this uh, without just saying, eh, don't worry about it. It'll all take care of yourself if you listen to your body. Yeah. And that's why I, I really think, you know, health and fitness is a practice, right? It's, it's something you work on every day. And, you know, f- so for me, like I weigh myself every day. I check my body fat every day. I, you know, I have literally three trackers on. Um, and to me, it's just data and feedback about how I'm living my life. And, you know, so if I like, I can tell like my HRV, like if I'm really stressed out, my HRV suffers. And so like, for me, I'm like, okay, cool. What are the things that I can do to like lower my stress? Like, do I need to take a nap? Do I need to meditate more? Do I need to remove some of my workload permanently? Right. And so, For me, it's not getting freaked out about what the data is saying, but it's like utilizing it to like empower my next steps forward or my my day forward. Right. So um, but also pairing that with a practice of listening to my body. So, okay, if I check in with my body, what is it really saying? Do I feel okay? Yeah, I actually do feel okay. And if I feel tired, like I said before, maybe I'll take a nap this afternoon, right? Or if I'm one of those people who cannot take a nap in the afternoon and I'm like, you know, I'm having caffeine at like a cup of coffee at 7 p.m. and I'm eating massive amounts of junk food and I'm drinking alcohol and I work 24 seven, like those are the people who need a tracker and they need to start seeing how their like their choices are affecting their health where then there's the other end of the spectrum where it's people have everything so optimized that they're like completely inflexible to like the randomness and variability of life. And so you and I, again, are like pointing, let's like get more into the middle. Right. And, and I think there is massive value in science, data, and technology, but there's also massive value in learning to tune in and listen to your body. But we have to be super careful because we're constantly being programmed by social media and marketing to like eat all the time, right? Like, you know, when we were before, before social media and marketing, we weren't being told by our environment, like, oh, eat all the time. We're actually spending most of our time trying to find food, right? Um, So I think it's, again, like, uh, what I really believe in is like self-dominion, right? So really like... Uh, and using like, you know, protecting yourself against the environment that may be trying to like harm you, but then also kind of using the science and the technology to empower your own self dominion, but not letting that like take over your life where it affects your, your health and your happiness. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's 
no doubt about it, this, these tools are, are really great. Like if you can see that your heart rate variability has gone down, like that's, that's awesome. Um, because you can't necessarily, unless perhaps someone who's really tuned in could sense that, but, but yeah. a lot of us, me included, can't, can't tell that unless my tracker tells me that, that it is. Yeah. Um, and, and the same, like, you know, the, the, my sleep tracker will tell you if you have a slight temperature rise, like you can know when you're getting sick a little bit before, at least yep. in my case, before your body actually knows that you're getting sick. And that's useful because you can start slowing down then and maybe fight that sickness off. Um, so there, there definitely is a use, a place for this stuff. And and the question is where, where is that balance? And, and, you know, how, how much do you need to be skilled at, at listening and experience that that stuff on your own? Um, but yeah, I, I love these, these ideas for sure. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, we all have to take that individual journey. Right. But I think, uh, a well-examined life around kind of all this stuff, lifestyle, health, fitness, your use of technology, um, you know, factoring in, you know, the randomness of life, I think, I think is a journey worth going on for all of us because, you know, we all want to like really live a great life and feel healthy and vibrant and energetic and happy. So, um, yeah. Uh, a little bit of a left turn, but it's something that I really love to ask all guests. Um, and it is one tip, tool, or strategy for fitness, for money, and for life. So one for each. And it could be anything. It could just be like what comes to mind first uh, that you think would be valuable if uh, you know, someone were listening to this show and to just give them a little leave behind. Yeah, uh, great. So for fitness, it's kind of new for me, maybe the past three years or so. Um, I'd say stop training to failure when, when, when in the gym. I don't know, I'm guessing based on how you look, it's not, uh, not one of your things, because it's not, it's not the way to get ripped and jacked, right? But like for me, this is how I've been able to train now for, for several years in a row without long laps, is because I stopped training to failure. It's like, and I don't dread the gym day anymore. I don't get hurt anymore. I don't get burned out. And like, I don't know, I've, I've shifted so much to be more longevity focused than like do any one thing this year or next year. Uh, there's still a place for that. But for me, that, that's been just a revelation to, to not have to train to failure. Uh, so that's been awesome for me with fitness. Um, money, I kind of already gave it, but I'll give it again, which is uh, don't, uh, don't hate on the safety net, right? The safety net can, can be really helpful for you. Uh, it's not for everybody, but, but I, when you're ready to quit that job, I'd say, give it another month and, and imagine what it would be like if you didn't have it and, and then make that decision. Uh, and then for life, I'm, I'm going to sound like the anti-technology guy here, but I, I think if you can go analog a little bit, it's, it's really good. If you can turn off the noise, you can stop watching the news, take some time away from social media, or you can get off it all the way. Uh, read books, talk to people, actually call like, Don't just text someone but like call them, get on Zoom with them, maybe even see them in person, as crazy as that idea would be. Uh, go outside, right? Nature, the, the textures you see in nature, the fractal pattern, that stuff is, this is soothing. Science says this. It is soothing for us compared to looking at surfaces and flatness, just like running on a trail is better for so much, including your mind, than running on the road. Um, I'm not a huge outdoors guy by any means. I, I really love being inside and reading or whatever. Um, it's just my, I'm just not a hiker or anything like that. But I, I realize now the importance of outside, just like, again, being more human, right? We're not supposed to be in a house all day or sitting all day, obviously. Uh, so go in a walk, wherever you can. You can find a minute here and there. Like, just read a real book instead of your Kindle. Much as I love my Kindle, just, I don't know, feels good to turn real pages sometimes. Yeah, I love those. Yeah, so I actually, again, so life changes as you get older right so when i was in my 20s and 30s like i could train to failure on every set and it was great mm -hmm. <laughs> the last couple of years i've had to be like maybe i can train to failure on the first two maybe three exercises but the other the the following two to three i gotta pull it back if i want to work out the next day mm -hmm. otherwise i'm gonna be I, I've destroyed myself too much. Um, yep. And so I'm literally going through this right now. It's like in the <laughs> last like two years, I've been like, because before I was like, you know, balls to the wall, every workout, pushing myself so freaking hard and I'd be fine the next day. But now if I do that, it's like, do you want to work out tomorrow? 
And if I'm like, okay, I, I'm okay if I take a rest day tomorrow, I might push every set to failure uh, for every exercise. But for me, I love to work out. Like it's just, it's part of my mental health. So I'd rather actually work out six or seven days a week and, and pull it back. So, you know, maybe in my twenties and thirties, I was going 110% every workout. And now in, you know, my early forties, I'm going like 70 to 85%. But then that allows me uh, you know, in a given workout throughout the entire of the workout. That doesn't mean I can't train to failure on the first, you know, like one or two exercises or even three, depending sure. on how big the workout is. So again, it's this like balance and, but also recognizing these things change throughout life. So like if I were coaching someone who was like 20, I'd be like, or in, you know, 21, I'd be like, yeah, go to failure on every single set. If you want to maximize your like muscle growth, right. like, yep. because you're at a time in your life when you can afford to do that and it will actually help you, um, in the long run. But then like I, if someone's like 60 years old, I wouldn't be like, yeah, train to failure on every single set. <laughs> like that's a recipe for injury. Right. Yep. Um, yep. the other thing I just want to mention, cause, cause it's been also super fascinating is literally happened in the last year and a half. So a year and a half ago, I used to be able to eat massive dinners and then immediately go to sleep like 15, 20 minutes ago, and I'd be fine. Great night of sleep, wake up, feeling refreshed. Now, if I do that, I fucking sleep like shit, and I wake up like feeling all groggy and fatigued. And so right. suddenly in the last year and a half, I'm having to learn how to like give myself like ideally three hours before I go to bed is like, seems to be the optimal, but I'm going through this testing period using my trackers to actually see like, Oh, when I give myself about three hours, that kind of optimizes for my recovery. Mm -hmm. And then if I only like wait an hour or two, then like, I know my HRV is going to be down. I know I'm going to feel more tired. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. And I think there's a healthy use of technology to kind of, help you transition through the way that your lifestyle needs to evolve in order to support your health and fitness throughout different age periods. Yep. I love that. And, uh, I'd say, I'd say, as you know, pair that with your own, maybe subjective viewpoint of like, how do I actually feel the next day? Right. Sleep tracker says I'm not better. How do I actually feel the next day after going to bed with a bunch of food in my stomach? Uh, versus not because I, I I'm dealing with the same things right do I like everyone says sleep in a cold room and likewise don't eat within several hours of bed like does it actually matter I know my sleep thing might say do I feel better so I don't know I, I wonder about these same things what uh what tracker do you use is it is a whoop <laughs> so I use a a whoop uh a garmin and an aura I'm a bit oh, nice. of like no. I'm I'm like I love tracking uh all mm -hmm. things like I step on my my withing scale every day that gives me my muscle mass, my body uh, fat percentage and my weight. Um, like I just enjoy tracking. It's just fun for me. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, I would call it like a hobby for me, but I, I try to like use it in conjunction with kind of like the more like, I don't know, uh, empathic, you know, sensory, like, how do I, what's my heart telling me? You know what I mean? My, what's my body telling me? Like, I like, so like, I call myself a life alchemist because I believe in like pairing kind of like magic with science and mm -hmm. like real life with the kind of like esoteric. Um, yeah. yep. and I'm not like all one, like, oh, it's only science. Like, cause yeah. I think that gets people into trouble. Like, we've been talking about all the time where they're so overly reliant on science that they literally without science, they'd be lost. Yeah. I love that. And we, we've, I told you about the book where we're thinking about, and we've, we've had that conversation is like, how much do we, how much magic belongs in here versus just like trying to make it sound like, how much can we talk about like placebo effects and like the power of like belief, which is a, there is some science around that, right? Habit change happens when you believe you can change. Like Charles Duhigg in the power of habit says that's the most powerful one more than any of the triggers and cues and all that stuff. Like if you believe that you actually can change that, that has the single biggest impact on whether or not you succeed. Uh, so I fully believe in some of that magic and uh, trying to figure out how much I can, I can admit that. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on that journey too. Cause I definitely believe in magic and it's like how yeah. upfront, uh, on the online world do I want to uh, get into that? Right. Um, so Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. Any last words of wisdom, thoughts, topics that you want to cover requests from the audience or anything like that? Um, can I promote my morning show that I do every day? Absolutely. And we didn't even get okay. to talk about that. If you want to spend a few minutes, uh, we can totally go over on time if you have the time and talk a little bit about that. No, it's okay. I just, it's just, it's something we do every day. It's called the plant based morning show. It's uh, it started off on Instagram plant based morning show is the, uh, the handle, but now we're on YouTube much more often or, or much more attention put onto the YouTube feed. Uh, it's just fun. I, I was, I never did video. I was like, you know, text first, then audio, very slow to adopt YouTube and video. But uh, I've had a great time doing it. It's been a little like challenge of doing something every single day. And uh, we just talk about plant-based headlines. Some of it's health, some of it's just goofy stuff. Um, but yeah, please, please check that out. And uh, it's youtube.com slash no meat athlete. We're still using that, that one. And then the supplements are all at uh, lovecompliment.com. Very uh, mindful approach to supplementation. It started out as everything you need, nothing you don't. And that was the idea. We did not want to like overload people with you know, mega vitamins and all that. It was just, it's just a mindful approach. Uh, so if that's, if that's your kind of thing, check it out, lovecompliment.com. And they can get the, uh, at home, uh, biomarking biomarker testing kit from there as well. Right. Yes. That's called insight. And it's its own little separate branch of that, uh, of our services. That we yeah. Offer. Which I highly encourage everyone, uh, no matter your age, uh, you know, Matt, you mentioned earlier in the show, it's like, you think you're like your health is totally covered because you're a hundred percent vegan and like your diet's yeah. protecting you or you're a hundred percent carnivore and that's like protecting you. Like, why don't you just find out like where you're at and then you can use that data to like shore up any, uh, you know, places that need to be shore up. So, yeah. um, I actually yeah. just got the kit. Um, so I'm going to, oh, I'm going to be testing it out. I might, uh, Matt Tolman and I've been talking. So, uh, I'm just going to say I might get, uh, Matt and Matt to give me a discount code for the listeners for that home test. Um, cool. if we get that set up, it will be code dragon to get X percent off. I don't know. I'll talk to Matt Tolman about it, but, uh, you can go to compliment, um, dot com, get the testing kit and use code dragon. You'll get a discount. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Do oh that. yeah. Well, I want to support people, you know, figuring out where they're at so that they can live their healthiest, fittest, richest life. Very nice. Awesome. Thank, thanks for coming on the show, brother. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. It was fun.